So this is the uh, 12th annual Earth and Space Sciences Distinguished Alumni Lecture. I'm Joe Rudnick. I'm the uh, Dean of Physical Sciences. And Physical Sciences is the justly proud and pleased home of the Department of Earth and Space Sciences. Um, Earth and Space Sciences at UCLA has a uh, storied history, a distinguished presence, and a bright future. It is world renowned for the breadth of the investigations pursued there. And it's also equally renowned for the quality of the people who work and are trained there. And now I'm going to lead a, read a list. This is a, I had to write this down because I wanted to talk about the range of research that's being done here. It, it runs the gamut from petrology and geochemistry to seismic processes, both here on Earth and on other planets, the sun and moons, to work on paleoclimates, on ancient life forms, on quaternary processes, on orogeny, on the history, structure, and atmospheres of planets, moons and protoplanets, the constitution of our solar system, on magnetospheric events, the nature of the Earth's mantle and its core, and actually I could go on even further, but I think you get a sense for the breadth, the range of activities carried out here. Um, a bit more about the division. Uh, to, in addition to Earth and Space Sciences, the Division of Physical Sciences is home to five other departments, uh, physics and astronomy, chemistry and biochemistry, atmospheric and oceanic sciences, mathematics and statistics. It also has institutes associated with it, the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics, the Institute for the Environment and Sustainability, and actually a number of other affiliated research centers. The distinguished research of the faculty has led to national and international recognition, a bit of self-advertisement here, uh, four Nobel Prizes, a Fields Medal, six National Medals of Science, and 24 members of the National Academy of Sciences. I should point out that Earth and Space Sciences accounts for a disproportionate fraction of our honored faculty. In fact, and, uh, of the two members of the Physical Sciences faculty elected this year to the National Academy of Sciences, the most august association of scientists in the United States, one of them is in the audience here, uh, Mark Harrison. And I don't, where is he? Yes. Where is he, Mark? I, I assume he's here, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay, good. <laughs> no student stand or anything. <laughs> um, and now I'm, I'm, I'm about to step off stage because it's my pleasure to introduce Department Chair Craig Manning, who will tell you a little bit more about the department and the history of the of this annual uh, Distinguished Alumni Lecture. Uh, I've actually come to know Craig personally as an unusually committed and effective departmental chair. And actually, in fact, if I were asked uh, who among the faculty would be best suited to take over my job, uh, there would be a very short list and Craig would be at the top of it. <laughs> I noticed... <laughs> I, I, I saw the uh, expression on his face. I mean, I know that Craig is actually had to be hectored into taking on an extra year as chair, and I know he's looking forward to life after the burdens of that job, uh, but I intended that as a compliment, Craig. <laughs> uh, and actually, there's much more to Craig than his manifest uh, administrative talents. He's also an extraordinarily strong scientist, um, and something I had not appreciated until I was educated very recently is you know, the importance of the fact that the Earth is different from every other planet in the solar system in that because of the existence of liquid water at its surface and especially because of the catalyzing effect it has on rocks at depth. In fact, the Earth's crust is a direct consequence of the interaction of aqueous fluid with plate tectonic boundaries. Uh, this means that an understanding of fluid rock interactions is essential to a comprehension of how our planet works. And Craig is among the handful of experts who've established the direction of current research on the roles of fluids at depth of the Earth and how their interactions with rocks shape our planet. Uh, Craig's lab is a destination for experimental geochemists from around the world who visit UCLA and Craig in order to learn his unique and powerful methods for studying liquids under extreme conditions of pressure and temperature. So uh, with that, I would like to yield the stage, the podium, to Craig. Thank you. Well, that's very
very kind, Joe. Uh, I assure you, in, being in my fourth year of three as chair, that I'm not gunning for <laughs> your job. <laughs> um, it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Harry Green, who's a three-degree man from UCLA, and we're very proud of that. Um, but as an alumnus from, this, from our department, I'm sure uh, Harry will appreciate that uh, this is an event that, where we are very pleased to open our doors and, and welcome back to campus alumni from uh, the past and uh, give them a, a sense of what we're doing here in the, in the department and what's happening uh, in the department these days. Um, we try to keep in touch with the alumni uh, throughout the year, and many of you probably know us from our annual newsletter where we try to promote the heck out of what we're doing and let you know that uh, we are proud of it and also let you know that we're proud of you and that we're anxious to stay in touch. Uh, remember that this comes out in the fall, so any of you who have any updates for this coming newsletter, which we're, we'll be starting to put together tomorrow after this event today. Um, uh, please do contact us. You can get there via our new website, which has just gone up uh, this last month, uh, and you'll see that there's a, a, a place for alumni to, uh, to navigate through the website there. Part of the, our role as uh, keepers of the flame that you all participated in in some time in the past uh, is as stewards of the uh, of the benevolence that comes from alumni like you. And part of that stewardship involves, uh, you know, making sure that, the, that the, the, the funds that have come to us from your good graces are looked after well and are used in an effective way. And uh, I just wanted to make sure that everybody here appreciates that we have a number of uh, scholarships and fellowships that have been made possible by alumni. Uh, they're listed here in a very fine print. Um, because there are numerous enough that it's hard to get them all on one page. But uh, I just want you to appreciate that there's a, quite a, a, a variety of these. Some are from alumni, some are also from faculty or in fa in the, uh, to honor faculty. They're almost all to look after students and provide student support. And this is extremely important to us uh, and it's no secret that California right now is struggling to find new ways to uh, fund higher education and failing mostly. Uh, and and uh, it's especially important, important in these times for us to be able to provide uh, some support to our, our students through uh, this kind of mechanism. And in fact, we uh, last year were one of the uh, leaders in the Division of Physical Sciences in terms of the uh, uh, alumni uh, donations. And that, of that, we're very, very proud. And I thank you, I thank you all for it uh, tonight. One of our alumni, very distinguished, is Harry Green. And Harry Green, as you see here, got uh, three degrees in 1963, 67, 68. It was a very quick PhD after that master's. <laughs> uh, after li being liberated from UCLA, he uh, went on to a postdoc for a couple years, I think at Case Western Reserve University, and then uh, was uh, appointed to the faculty at UC Davis, where he spent uh, some 22 years. Before coming back to the Southland, he uh, moved to Riverside in 1992 and has been there since. Uh, he was made distinguished professor in 1998. He's also had several stints as the director of the Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics uh, at the Riverside campus. Uh, he's been uh, given some of the highest awards in his discipline, uh, uh, most notably the Bowen Award in 1999, which is a, an award from the American uh, Geophysical Union. And uh, he's, as you see here, he's now currently uh, the president of the tectonophysics section at the American Geophysical Union. And the subject of his talk tonight will have to do with deep earthquakes, and it's important to kind of recognize that deep earthquakes are especially important to us uh, as a society, not so much in Southern California, where the source of our seismicity tends to be a little more shallow, but in other places where some of the greatest earthquakes occur on Earth, and uh, these tend to be among the most dangerous and the most damaging uh, seismic events uh, that occur on our planet. 
And Harry is notable for having made some fundamental contributions to how we understand these particularly dangerous uh, seismic events. And I've listed a few of the contributions here. They include uh, understanding something about how they nucleate uh, in terms of the mineral transformations that take place at depth, uh, something about how the faults actually work at high pressures, which is a, not an easy problem because the pressures are so high, and also about the role of uh, water, which, of course, is something, as you just heard, is, is of course, interesting to me personally. But it's this uh, particular set of contributions under the theme of uh, deep earthquakes that, uh, for which Harry is best known. And so it's a distinct honor and pleasure tonight to introduce him to give the uh, 12th annual uh, Distinguished Alumni Lecture uh, here at UCLA. Harry. I don't have to chase too much. I don't no, you are just, you're free to go with just one. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me here. Um, thank you very much for the kind introductions. Um, and it's a, this is a very considerable honor for me to be asked back to, to give this particular <coughs> lecture. Um, and so I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes uh, reminiscing a little bit about, mostly about names of people and so on before I start. Um, uh, so here's an outline of the things I'll talk about. Very briefly about the memories of UCLA, you see three uh, items for the uh, introduction, and then I'll give three little vignettes uh, <clears throat> over the course of the, of the hour or something less than an hour, I hope, um, about high pressure faulting, uh, about rocks that have been uh, have come to the surface from very great depth, uh, hundreds of kilometers, um, and a more recent uh, discovery of similarly uh, high pressure minerals from an ophiolite which has not been hit by an asteroid and has not been subducted, and yet it has uh, minerals in it which weren't stable, um, well, at least to indicate that the depth had to be more than 300 kilometers. Uh, so memory of, UC, of UCLA in the 60s, uh, of course, my principal memories are from my, my mentors, David Griggs and John Christie were my PhD supervisors, and I worked for Gary Ernst as an undergrad um, and did, little did I know that that was peripherally involved in um, something which I'll refer to again later on. <coughs> uh, then these other names are names that come, that come back to me from my time here, and I don't have time to go through. I could go on at length about each one of them in one way or another, sometimes quirks of their personality, other times other things. But, uh, I've signal, singled out Bill Ruby's name because it was in Bill Ruby's seminar that I first realized that continental drift was real. I knew about the geological evidence for it, and in Bill Ruby's seminar, I learned about paleomag, and both things completely independently led to similar sorts of conclusions, and that was quite a, an awakening for me. And that was, of course, several years before um, the, plate, the formal plate tectonic revolution. Um, Jan and Terry Tullis, Jim Blasick, David Baker, Yvonne Getting, well, actually, in the, the first four, Jan and Terry Tullis, Jim Blasick, and David Baker were in the Griggs Christie lab while I was a student there. Um, Yvonne Getting came to work with, John, with um, George Kennedy uh, at the same time. Uh, and there's some other connections with Yvonne because Yvonne's father was a very close friend of Dave Griggs in Dave's other world of being a military consultant par excellence. Uh, and Steve Kirby joined the lab just as I was, as I was leaving. Uh, <clears throat> and then there are other things that come back to me, little pieces of, of, of Griggs' uh, other life, as I said, which I will not talk about, but we can go on and on forever in the discussion if you would like. Um, Edward, uh, I met Edward Teller several times in Griggs' lab and in his home and so on. Um, General Jimmy Doolittle, which uh, was quite a surprise one night, he introduced it at one of his parties, and he was part of the Rand Corporation and so on. So these are just memories that I'm remembering. I was standing in the office, um, 
the same office you still have in the, in the geology building when I first heard that John Kennedy had been shot. Um, and there wasn't any San Diego freeway when I started coming to UCLA. Uh, it was through the tunnel and down Sepulveda, um, and it was an interesting drive. And of course, very quickly after that was, the freeway was built, it also became an interesting drive. <coughs> uh, so, uh, let me move on then to, to start talking about the things I'd like to talk to you about. Um, and one particularly very important thing in geology and geophysics is scaling. How can we bridge the gap between the sizes and rates of natural processes and those attainable in the laboratory? Because the differences are huge. Natural processes occur on length scales of tens to thousands of kilometers over millions and billions of years, except for earthquakes. Uh, <clears throat> and in high pressure experiments that I'll talk about, we're reduced to millimeter, centimeter size specimens and times of minutes to weeks. So how do you find, put any connection between those two things? And the good news is that the physics is stored at the, mic at the nanoscale and the microscale. So the, the smaller scale you look at, the more likely you are to be able to find vestiges of memory of what the rocks have experienced. And that's been a very, very useful thing for me uh, throughout my career. And I've been able to use then uh, the transmission electron microscope images of natural rocks and experimental rocks to understand that the same physics was going on for deformation or whatever it might happen to be. Now most of the things I'm interested in are so deep you never see any rocks. Uh, and that makes it much harder. But the basic physics is stored there, so th and we can then com try to compare the physics of what went on in the Earth and what's going on in the experiments. Here's a slice through the Earth. Uh, I'm going to talk about plate tectonics in a very general way in the, in the beginning uh, for people who, for whom that's not as well known as it is for, I presume, most everybody in this, in this audience. So there's a slice of our world. Um, we've got a core that occupies the the, uh, about half the radius, a little bit more perhaps. Most people think of the core as being tiny. Uh, and then the rocky um, hollow sphere around it, which goes from 2,900 kilometers depth to the surface. <coughs> and the upper mantle, lower mantle boundary is about 700 kilometers um, depth. And so everything I'm going to talk about today uh, occurs in the upper mantle, the orange uh, outer rind there. Um, but some of the things I do now also involve things in the lower mantle. Uh, so basically, plate tectonics and all of its manifestations are a, a way that the Earth cools itself. And so it's by convection. Everybody knows what happens if you heat water in the laboratory. If you heat it so you still don't boil it, you just heat it. Um, it will develop circles of circulation as hot water is carried from the bottom to the top and cold water back down again. Uh, and the Earth does something similar. This is a rather crude and old cartoon of what goes on in the Earth. But the essence is there for ridges and trenches and the plates that move around on the surface reflecting the, uh, but not reflecting directly as indicated here, the flow inside. So here's what our Earth looks like if we, if we drain all the water out of the oceans, which is probably not a good idea. Uh, <clears throat> but what we see then, most notably when we do that, is the the worldwide uh, network of ocean ridges. Uh, and so that starts with the upwelling part of convection. Uh, as again, most everybody knows, maybe everybody here knows, the oceans form by um, upwelling at the ocean ridges. The plates are moving away and the rock uh, comes up and it melts by decompression and the melt comes up, makes the crust, and the rest gets left behind as the lithosphere, and the ocean, bits of the ocean trundle away from the, from the ridge. So clearly, the stuff far from the ridge must be older than the stuff close to the ridge, and we've now quantified that. I, we, I speak loosely, I haven't done anything about that. Uh, the, our, our profession has. So that's a rather ugly slide, I'm afraid, but it shows the, in colors, the relative ages, and one thing you can see, for example, if you're new to this game, is that you see blues on either side of the Atlantic between North America and Africa. You don't see them in the South Atlantic, and that tells us that the North Atlantic opened earlier than the South Atlantic. Here's what worldwide seismicity looks like. I'll be talking about <coughs> deep earths and rocks that have come to the surface from great depths. 
So we're talking about subduction zones in almost every case. All the bright colors you see there are outlining deep earthquakes. All the boring little reds and uh, oranges and yellows are the shallow ones that occur in the crust um, uh, and in the ocean ridges. And of course, if you're in one of those earthquakes, it's not very boring, but in terms of my science, it is. So here's a, a, a uh, couple of bits of information to, to get us started. <coughs> Uh, <coughs> sorry. Here's a profile of the earthquake activity in the Earth. Uh, so if you think of the Earth as an onion that has many different layers, and each layer is about 10 kilometers thick, um, then this diagram tells you, uh, with a logarithmic scale here and a linear scale there, um, that if you think about 10 kilometer thick layers in the Earth, uh, inside each one of these little 10 kilometer thick layers, you can put that, if you put in the number of earthquakes per year of magnitude 5 or larger, you get this distribution. So that's worldwide. Uh, and so it's of the order of 100 per year uh, in 10 kilometer groups uh, at the surface. There's an exponential decline to about 300 kilometers, a plateau at only about one a year worldwide to about over 400 kilometers, and then a second population that comes up and crashes before you get to the bottom of the lower of the upper mantle. Uh, and now we have enough earthquakes, we could add another decade here in the log scale, and we still wouldn't get anything. It still would just plunge straight down. There are no earthquakes in the lower mantle. Uh, here's a cartoon from uh, a paper of mine, or two of them actually, but uh, they don't differ by very much. Uh, so there's an ocean ridge way over here to the right somewhere, uh, and the ocean floor has been created. It trundles across and turns around and goes down. Um, Water is released in, in relatively shallow depths and flux is melting to produce the arcs. Uh, all of this, uh, most everybody knows. And here's the distribution of earthquakes um, that we see at depth. There's a little, it was one little error in this picture. Those red spots up there in the beginning should be on top of the black line. The black thick line is the oceanic crust. And in the beginning, the earthquakes are all at the surface, at the interface. And that's those horrible earthquakes like the one that Japan just underwent that um, are the ones that cause so much damage to, uh, to, the, to humanity. But after about 50 kilometers or maybe 70, the earthquakes actually migrate into the slab, into the downgoing lithosphere. And the sliding between the, the downgoing plate and the, and the mantle around it becomes silent. Uh, and the earthquakes then have this, this uh, profile, uh, and they come down less and less and less. At, at the uh, top, there are actually two different bands, and so they're referred to as a double seismic zone. Um, and then uh, the earthquakes will go rather continuously all the way down to the bottom of the lower, uh, of, the upper, uh, of the upper mantle, and there's actually a depression that goes down below because of the temperature dependence of the phase boundary, which represents the, thing, the uh, difference between the upper mantle uh, and the lower mantle. So I've labeled this region in green as by olivine, which means olivine is the dominant mineral uh, uh, above 410 kilometers. And I've labeled this part spinel, which is a little bit of a simplification, but it'll do for our talks today, as representing the mantle transition zone. Now there are other minerals there, but for the earthquake issue, it's the olivine going to spinel, which you'll see as, is critical. And here then, in, with the speckled uh, morphology, is the slab which, is, which goes all the way down. This one is, is imagined to go directly into the lower mantle. Some slabs do, others fold out and lie on top. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, of what I've just talked about, we could talk about mid-ocean ridges and subduction zones. This is where things come up, this is where things go down. Um, and there's three, I'd like to put three different categories uh, in, in amongst there. Generation and extraction of basalt to form the oceanic crust, as I mentioned. I'll talk about that very little, but I'll talk about it a little when I come back at, at the end. And most of the talk then will contain uh, discussion of continuous generation of earthquakes down to 700 kilometers and how that can happen. Uh, when you can't break anything deeper than about 50 kilometers. And exhumation of rocks from great depth in continental collision zones. Uh, we'll start with earthquakes. 
Uh, but before we talk about how earthquakes happen at depth, <coughs> I need to point out that earthquakes at depth are probably breaking of intact rock rather than sliding on pre-existing faults, and that rocks cannot break at high pressure. By cannot break, I mean by the normal physics that, that uh, things break in this room or anywhere else on the surface of the Earth, uh, or down a little ways. However, certain mineral reactions can overcome this inhibition, enabling earthquakes to 700 kilometers depth, uh, but no more. So all the earthquakes I'm going to talk to you about all require a mineral reaction to allow the earthquake to start. But I'm going to go all the way back as to how things fail brittly, and I hope you'll all see the connection pretty quickly. So imagine that you've got a cylinder of rock, you've got a big machine, and you start leaning on it, you're squeezing it, um, and eventually it breaks. And we all, I would think, we all imagine that a tiny little fault formed somehow, and then it propagated across and broke it in half. Uh, broken in two pieces. That's generally correct, but there's a very important preliminary step which must take place or, or you, oh, that doesn't happen. Um, and that is that faults are produced by multiplication and self-organization of tension cracks. So I'm talking now about a material which doesn't have any faults in it already. And if you start to, to load up, oops, I went too fast. If you start to load, it's better here, sorry. If you start to load up a cylinder of rock or any specimen, you know, these little white lines are appearing, and I'm, they're little bitty cracks that are forming, and they form a parallel to compression. Uh, they're tensile cracks, and they form rather randomly in the beginning, but eventually they, they uh, coalesce, they start forming in greater abundance somewhere in this cartoon that's going to be right there. Um, and then from that uh, strong concentration, the fault is born. Um, and uh, propagates. And that's an important uh, aspect that without these little microcracks that formed first, this failure won't take place. So uh, let's take a look at, at those tensile cracks. We see that if they're open, they have very high tensile stresses at their tips. And these little cracks talk to each other through the elastic continuum of the material, and they self-organize and lead to the little fault which then propagates. Uh, and the some of the material I'm going to talk to you about at, at high pressure requires a self-organization process like that. Uh, <clears throat> but what happens if you go down in depths where this, the uh, lowest stress is compressive, so a tensile crack can't open because it's being pushed shut by the, by the local pressure. But if you had a fluid present in some fat form or another, which can help, then you can open the crack by putting, allowing fluid to go in and fill it. Um, and so, the earthquakes near the surface can happen by brittle processes and then frictional sliding on faults that have been created. And at somewhat greater depths, if there's a fluid present in the rock, it can help these little tensile cracks open, and therefore the same physics can, can, can continue. So here's an example of that from my lab. <coughs> there's, uh, this is at 3 GPA, that's so more or less 90 kilometers equivalent depth in the earth. The amount of fluid that I'm going to talk about in just a moment is only one-tenth of one percent, approximately. This is an eclogite, a high-pressure equivalent to basalt, that uh, had a little bit of water dissolved in the, in the uh, minerals. And when we got to a particular temperature, the water dissolved to the grain boundaries, uh, fluxed melting, and the material broke, and you see what looks like just a broken layer there. If we look away from the fault zone, we see this in the optical microscope, and all those little vertical lines going up and down there are exactly those little cracks that I was telling you about. They show up magnificently here because the melt that formed and filled them, allowed them to open, um, was basalt, and it's now represented by brown glass, so you see it readily in the thin section. Uh, here's another example of serpentine that's been dehydrated, and tigerite is one of the varieties of serpentine. Uh, and release of water by dehydration of uh, any hydrous mineral also produces a fluid which can do exactly the same thing about assisting little cracks from opening and allowing faulting to occur. Uh, here is a magnetite uh, little domain here, and there's the piece on the other side of this particular experimental fault. Back to the original diagram we talked about then, these earthquakes are probably all the same physics as the ones at the surface, although only the first 50 or 70 kilometers or so are really true brittle failure without this need for a fluid 
to enable the, the failure at higher pressures. But what about this thing here? Um, they're called deep earthquakes, earthquakes deeper than 300 kilometers. And so the questions, well, two of the questions that are important anyway is, why do they become more abundant starting there, and why do they stop there? Well, a graduate student and I um, found what we believe is the answer to that. Um, quite a long time ago, 1989, we published. This picture of nature is lying on its side because I always give my talks with the compression direction north-south. And I didn't tell nature that. Uh, I sent them a square picture, and they chose it for the cover, but they chose it to do it sideways. So I, I put it down this way. So this is a, a, a failure which takes place during the phase transformation from olivine to spinel. In the original discovery, it was olivine that has germanium substituting for silicon. And germinates are common analogs for silicates, and they work very well in many ways, but they're not perfect. Uh, the advantage is that this thing goes through the olivine spinel transformation at low pressures that I could get at in my laboratory, and the silicate doesn't do that until very much higher pressures. And there still are no in instruments that can allow you to do good controlled deformation experiments at the conditions of the, of the silicate olivine spinel transformation. But nevertheless, it was important for us to show that, that, does ha that this failure mechanism does happen in the silicate, and we were successful in doing that. I'll show in just a moment. The, one of the interesting things about this, this is a phase diagram for magnesium orthogerminate. Olivine is stable above this line in the blue field, and the rest is spinel. You'll notice oh, there's no numbers there. Well, if there were, um, room temperature's down about here, so the spinel phase is actually the stable phase uh, at room um, pressure. But at any rate, if you make an olivine polycrystal and you deform it, here, where this would be 1 kilobar, two, uh, 10 kilobars, 20 kilobars, 30 kilobars, etc. Um, if you deform it under these conditions, the reaction runs quite easily, and the crystals nucleate, they grow, the material gets weaker because of the rea reaction going on, but nothing breaks. And down here, it's so cold that the reaction doesn't run at all, and it doesn't break. The material is very strong, but it still flows ductally. But in this little window in between, at about 1200 Kelvin, um, things called anti-cracks form in, the, in this metastable olivine, and the specimens break. So let me, now you must be wondering what an anti-crack is, uh, so I'll get to that in a moment. Let me show you one first. So here is an SEM image, quite an old one. SEMs nowadays are much better. But all those little white lines you see, or flame-like structures you see here, those are these things I'm calling anti-cracks, which I'll explain to you in just a moment. But they are filled with, they are the spinel phase that fills the inside of them, and the grain size is extraordinarily fine. It's of the order of 30 nanometers, when a unit cell of that phase is about 10 nanometers. Um, I'm sorry, it's about one nanometer, 10 angstroms. So what's an anti-crack? Well, suppose you had a, a densification phase transformation take place. So this is olivine, and you nucleate a little grain of spinel, which is represented by the purple spot. Uh, the material, that's more dense than the surroundings. And so the phase, because it's a high pressure, the interface is stuck between the two. And so as this densifies, it pulls in the surroundings and produces a stress around it. And the greatest compressive stress will be across the boundary normal to maximum compression. And that's going to, going to favor the next nucleation event to take place right next to it in this stress concentration. And so you would likely to get a couple more, which will make the stress concentration worse. So the solution to the problem actually makes the other larger scale problem worse. And this thing can then happen rapidly, <coughs> especially for an exothermic reaction. And you end up with a picture that looks like that, where you have a crack-shaped object filled with this nanocrystalline material. Um, and there are very strong uh, stresses, but it's, uh, they're compressive stresses, they're not tensile stresses. So if we can compare cracks and anti-cracks, you see their orientations are 90 degrees out. Oop, that thing just went all crazy. Sorry, there's something happened to the, um, to the, with the, with the projector or whatever. Uh, but you saw what the picture was before. I'll go back one step so you can see the, the organization of the tensile stresses. 
uh, and you'd seen this one before also. So a, a crack, an open crack go, lies this way, an open anti-crack lies that way. The stresses are tensile here and compressive there. Otherwise, they're the same. And in fact, the uh, material, these things can talk to each other through the elastic continuum through their compressive stresses, just like the others do. And they have the same kind of self-organization which takes place, um, leading to failure. Uh, and as I told you, we first found it in magnesium orthogerminate, which isn't very exciting to, to geologists. Uh, here we've managed to do, they were crude experiments, but we managed to do it nevertheless. And at 14 GPA um, in mantle olivine, this is a, this is a fault. It's offset that grain there by about 30 microns or so. <clears throat> and if you can see from the back, you probably can't. There are a lot of little arrowheads in this picture, and they all point to anticracks. The, the combination between the failure possibility and anticracks is one to one. If you don't get the anticracks, you don't get failure, and vice versa. Uh, so let's go back uh, to this um, earlier cartoon. This other mechanism, this new mechanism that we proposed to explain deep earthquakes um, would require that there be metastable olivine in the slab. So if you imagine that the cold interior of a slab might be so cold that the reaction doesn't run, there would be a narrow tongue getting thinner and thinner going down, uh, the, reacting to the spinel phase along its boundary as it heats up. and I've stylistically then put earthquakes on the, on the boundaries. Uh, <clears throat> we have the double seismic zones have been found at um, these sorts of depths. Here's a, some from a paper by Doug Weens and colleagues um, in the, in the uh, subduction zone um, uh, beneath Tonga in the southwest Pacific. So you can explain all the earthquakes. Doesn't mean that all earthquakes have to be by these simple mechanisms, but you can explain them all. They, they might all be by these mechanisms of just simple brittle failure at the surface or frictional sliding, um, fluid uh, assisted brittle failure at greater depths, um, and this new mechanism uh, involving um, anti-crack self-organization as explaining um, the rest. Um, and what I did, what I just realized that I neglected to put into the slides here is a picture of the fault zone. I'm t I use nano in the title here. If you look at the fault zone, if you look at the anticracks, I told you the grain size was very, very small, about 30 nanometers. And if you look at the fault zones that are generated by this material, you also find extremely fine grain material. So the, the reason all of this works is because at, at the nanoscale, um, the material can flow by, by grain boundary sliding not like a bag of sand, it's by the, the, there's, there's no um, dilation process that goes on by grain boundary sliding. So it's sort of like fish eggs, that sort of slide, can slide past one another without opening up spaces. Uh, and the material will be very weak, even at seismic st strain rates, uh, and therefore can behave like a fluid, and it can do exactly the same thing as the real fluid does at shallower pressures, but it does it through this funny anti-crack process because the reaction that's producing this fine-grained stuff is producing a more dense phase than the starting material. Um, the, uh, there was a, a, a very nice book which credited um, Pamela and myself for solving the mystery of deep earthquakes, which was published about 10 years ago. Uh, but in fact, there's been more than 10 years ago. But in fact, it's been quite an ongoing quest because for a long time, seismologists couldn't find any evidence for metastable olivine. And if there wasn't any metastable olivine, then there can't be any, any earthquakes by this mechanism. But they've now been found in several different subduction zones, um, the metastable olivine. So it's looking more and more as if this is indeed the mechanism for deep earthquakes. Uh, so in summary, the earthquakes up here are shallow. This arrow is red instead of our, the shallow ones are, are by dehydration, uh, almost surely. Um, the red line points to this sec second set, and there's still some controversy about whether that one may be the dehydration process or not. Uh, there also could be exsolution of water and melting, as I showed in the very beginning, uh, by materials in the crust and so on, which could explain some earthquakes here. And the deeper ones are probably by this other mechanism, which I just showed you very briefly. 
Uh, why no earthquakes here? Well, that's, a, that's really beyond the scale of the time that I have to, to say here. But the, the answer is that in order to get the instability, there must be a polymorphic phase transformation that's exothermic. It's not good enough for it just to be exothermic, it must be also polymorphic. Um, and so olivine to spinel is an exothermic polymorphic transformation. But the breakdown to the two phases down below um, is not, and so the earthquake instability is quenched, and we've demonstrated those kinds of things in the laboratory. So now I want to switch gears and talk about uh, an entirely different subject, and it still involves subduction zones, however, and that is that in the region where subduction zones are uh, present, uh, we now know from quite a number of places in the world where rocks have come to the surface from very great depth. In some cases, they're peridotites, which have just had a one-way street coming to the top, but they came up the down staircase, so to speak. They came up the subduction zone. And in other cases, there are actually things which have been subducted to hundreds of kilometers and come back to the surface in the same subduction zone. <clears throat> so what's a continental collision zone? For those of you who don't know, so let's go back 90 million years. This is what the uh, distribution of, of uh, uh, land looked like. And this thing with the red asterisk on it is India, down near the South Pole. And that's 90 million years ago. If we step forward to 50 million years ago, India is almost all the way across the Indian Ocean and closing fast on Asia. At 10 million years ago, it was beginning to collide with Asia. Uh, and today, uh, we see the continents that look just like this, with India still trying to push Asia out of the way. And so if you look at that on a modern day map, that's what it looks like. Uh, so there's India trying to push Asia out of the way, and Asia saying no. Um, this lump here is the T Tibetan Plateau, which um, is in part caused, and maybe completely caused, by the subduction of um, parts of India underneath it. Uh, <clears throat> and so this is a collision zone. And it's in the Himalayas sit right here, uh, and they're pushed up by this collision. And it's in rocks, it's in rocks like that, and in fact some rock, these rocks have been found in the Himalaya, where these high pressure minerals have been found. So the idea is that if you have um, two continents coming together, one of them going down and the other one not, uh, you can break pieces off the overriding crust, and everything is very cold uh, here at the surface, at least cold for rocks. And so the things, so bits and pieces can be hauled down and held down, even though they're buoyant continental material, it's cold and they can be held down by uh, the heavier stuff which is pulling them down. But eventually those th th things are going to heat up because the interior of the earth is warm. And eventually bits and pieces can come back up, and it's quite amazing, but they come back up the subduction zone near as we can tell. And I've put speckles on them in this case because they can bring smaller pieces of much heavier stuff with them. So if you, take, if you subduct um, continental material, it can be then the, the uh, pillow that brings back up, uh, or the balloon, if you wish, that brings up heavier rocks, eclogites, or peridotites from the mantle. Uh, so let me give a, a brief background on, on this relatively new field in, in geology. <laughs> it, it, from my view, it has, it's been through four principal stages. It brings me back to, to Gary Ernst. Gary, working here um, with yours truly as the guinea pig who was getting terrible headaches separating out minerals with um, heavy liquids, uh, may explain a lot of my behavior. Uh, the, uh, Gary was separating blue schists out of the Franciscan and doing various things, analyzing them or whatever. And he was also doing experiments. And he found that this blue amphibole, which was so strange, people had known about it for a long time, but nobody knew where it where it was stable, and he showed that it was only stable at low temperature and relatively high pressure for those days, and that meant that it had to go down fast and come back fast. And of course, immediately everybody said he was crazy, that that couldn't possibly happen. This was before plate tectonics, mind you. Um, and so there was this first cycle of disbelief, and, and there have been many cycles of disbelief in this subject. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, along came plate tectonics a few years later, and the Franciscan and other rocks like that became easily understood as exactly what um, Gary said they were. They were rocks that had to go down fast and come back fast. But now we had a mechanism. In 1984, cosite was discovered in two places in Europe. It was relatively reasonably accepted uh, in, in, uh, in northern Italy uh, because of the, the 
abundance of the evidence. In Norway, it was fought against um, violently for a long time. Um, diamond was discovered in, West, in the Western literature by Sobolev and Shatsky in 1990, those diamonds <coughs> in the Kachatav massif in metamorphic rocks. Uh, were known already in, in Russian publications, and that's why I say discovered in quotes. <clears throat> and lastly, I and my colleague Lisa, uh, Lisa Dobrzynitsky, who was here in the audience, and a postdoc, um, discovered microstructures which indicate very much greater depths than, than required to, f to make stable either cosite or diamond. So I'm going to want to go through now in a relatively short period of time and show you examples of the power, the powers of micro, the power of microstructures coupled, coupled with experiments um, can help us sort out these sorts of things and actually show that rocks have come from very great depth and therefore um, th those rocks may be able to tell us a lot. Uh, they've seen a lot going down and coming back of the fluids coming through them on their way to flux melting, etc. And lastly, I want to talk about a discovery of very high pressure minerals in ophiolites. Um, which provides a new window into uh, the deep upwelling mantle. Uh, so we start with the Alpe-Arami peridotite, which is um, uh, on Alpe-Arami, the mountain, uh, which is just above Bellinzona in the, in the Swiss Alps. It consists of four main minerals, as do all, almost all peridotites, and the, there's actually evidence for very great depth in three of those four minerals. I'll only talk about olivine and, and diopside today. Um, the first paper on this subject that Larissa and I published was in Science in 1996. You see this is a thin section picture. You see those funny little lines going in this direction. Uh, the pretty colors are serpentine along cracks, which the artists like, but just get in the way for the geology. Uh, and those are rods of ilmenite, and what you can't see is that there are also um, chromite platelets that are very thin and therefore almost transparent. Um, they're about four to one. Uh, ilmenite and chromite, and you can calculate what the equation is that must have precipitated them, I beg your pardon. Um, the important thing is that the ilmenite rods imply that there was greater than zero, six tenths of a weight percent of TiO2 in olivine, and that was absolutely absurd at that time. So the next thing we had to do was to do some experiments, and we proposed in that paper that the rocks must have come from very deep. And sure enough, here's the experiments that we, that we did. Uh, <clears throat> and we found little or nothing down here in terms of solubility, um, but the six tenths of a percent or a little bit more suggested that you would need about 10 GPA pressure, which is about 300 kilometers, which was embarrassingly the same as we had predicted. Uh, I'm going to come back to this diagram a few times because the, the, uh, the depth is going to get greater as we go along here. We also discovered a little while later and published in 99 in Science that there's an, also a very deep signal in the clinopyroxenes uh, in the rock, but only the clinopyroxenes, the diopsides, that are inside garnet. Uh, and that is an exolution process of another um, a pyroxene, a clinoenstatite, um, and it turns out that you can use the, the um, aspects of that phase to tell you a lot about where the material came from. So first of all, um, we could look for antiphase domains that would tell us whether this was a C2 over C pyroxene, uh, which would be the high pressure um, uh, polymorph of, of clinoinstatite. But there's also a high temperature clinoinstatite, which also unfortunately has C2 over C space group. So uh, we had to try to distinguish between those two. So first of all, we found the anti antiphase domains which indicate that indeed this thing had not originally been clinoinstatite, but had been the high temperature or the high pressure form. Um, and here's a boundary, uh, one of the boundaries between the, the domains. Uh, we had a hard time finding them actually because they're much smaller than any phase domains that have been found anywhere else. Uh, but you also notice that, that this, this is the boundary between one of those lamella that you saw in the lower mount. So one of these boundaries here. Um, this is the diopside host, and the, that's the lattice fringes parallel to the uh, to 100, uh, and these are the similar lattice fringes in the, in the lamella. And you notice that this is the, we're looking down the b-axis, so this is actually the c-axis direction, and you can see that the lamella makes a big angle, it's about 22 degrees, with the host. And I don't have time to go through the, the details, but um, we have subsequently 
been able to use experiments to show, not our own experiments, but others' experiments, to show that the angle of that lamella can actually tell us from how great a depth the material came. Uh, and in the case of Alpha Arami, it's about 400 kilometers. So what I've put here is, first, you saw this one first in the last diagram like this. Um, we did some additional work because of the controversy that erupted over the first results, and we found that actually that the, the abundance should have been 0.9% of TiO2 rather than 0.6, which raised the, the uh, amount of TiO2, but doesn't do an, all, an awful lot to change the, the depth that's suggested. But the pyroxenes tell us that the pressure must have been about this high, and we put everything together, and Alpirami must have come from just about there, which is a little less than 400 kilometers depth. There's no evidence in the prototypes that there's any prograde step, that this is just a, a piece of the mantle which got picked up by light stuff and brought to the surface. And I'm going to skip that uh, exhumation curve there, which, is, which just shows all the data which other people and, and we have uh, collected. Uh, and I want to tell you next about a, a politic gneiss. So that's a rock that was a shale when it began. And I'm going to try to convince you that, that, that the observations that I'm going to show you tell us that this rock went from a shale at the surface to about 350 kilometers riding down the back of a subduction zone and came back to tell the tale. Um, and it, it came back to tell us that it had stishovite in it. So stishovite is a very high pressure polymorph of quartz. Um, it's been found in nature only in shock meteorites and in meteorite craters. Um, and it would only be stable in the Earth at depths greater than about 300 kilometers, depending on the temperature. Um, experimental data suggests that a limit for subduction and return of continental rocks may be about 300 kilometers, where stishovite and potassium holandite structures become stable, <coughs> eliminating positive buoyancy. That is, stishovite and potassium, and, and potassium feldspar in the holandite structure, they both have densities of more than four. So if you can get a continental rock that's got a significant amount of potassium in it, It'll act, by the time you get to a little more than 300 kilometers, it'll be more dense than the ambient mantle and it will fall to the bottom of the upper mantle. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, of course, continental rocks have a wide variety of compositions. They don't all have a lot of potassium in them. So the ones that don't have a lot of potassium can be taken to that depth, perhaps, and still brought back. And identification of such rocks would demonstrate that deeper subduction is likely, thereby identifying the probable source of continental geochemical signatures in ocean island basalts. Geochemists have been saying, trace element geochemists have been saying for a long time that ocean island basalts have a signal in them which says they've interacted with the continents. And it looks like the answer is they've interacted with subducted pieces of the continents. Uh, and the rock I'm about to show you shows that subduction of continental material that far could, could reach the point of no return is indeed possible. So the rock I'm talking about comes from the Tibetan Plateau. Um, Lhasa is here. Chengdu, China is there. So it gives you an idea as to where it is. We're in the Himalaya. Um, uh, and as I say, this rock comes from there. Uh, <clears throat> it's the ugliest rock you ever saw in thin section. Every single mineral has things precipitated in it, reactions that have undergone, uh, and I don't know what all the stories I have to tell, but we've only sorted out the quartz story. Uh, so the quartz in this rock is in domains about four millimeters by seven millimeters. There is no quartz elsewhere in the rock. There's maybe three or four of such domains in a given thin section. Uh, they're, they're pretty rectangular, the shape of these things. And they, uh, they all look like this. So here's the edge of one of them, and you see a denuded zone around the edge, and then you see all these lines, these precipitates. And so here's, this is that place there. So you see that there's a huge number of lines going this way, but quite a number going in a variety of different directions. It's just a mess. And it turns out that all those rods, all those needles, are either spinel or kyanite. Um, and in a moment, I'll show you that rather than just being random and going in all kinds of different directions, they actually are very tightly oriented knots, which will allow us to unravel the story about stishovite. The first thing we noticed was that these, raw, the, these quartz domains I mentioned to you are, I call them domains because they're polycrystalline. So here is a high angle grain boundary. This is now, it's, again, a thin section between partially cross polarizers. So here is a, a high angle grain boundary. There's the orientation of the boundaries measured by EBSD. And you can see that this one 
uh, lineation just goes right through. It could care less about the boundary. There's no crystallographic relationship between these needles and quartz at all. It's as if the needles were there, floating in space or something, and quartz came along and just recrystallized around them and left them alone. Hard to believe, but the evidence you'll see. So the spinel is, is always a 110 uh, elongation, um, and the, the uh, kyanite is always elongated along 001. There are also rutile needles, but they're randomly oriented, and they don't seem to have anything important to say in this story. Um, you know, we knew right away there's no way you could dissolve that much aluminum or iron from the, those two phases in quartz. Uh, so even without the high angle grain boundary uh, observation, there's no way this stuff could have been dissolved from quartz. Now, the, the, if the needles were all there already, then quartz could grow around it. Uh, but if it was dissolved, it, it couldn't come from quartz. And what little was known about cosite suggested it couldn't come from cosite either, but it was already known that you could dissolve some aluminum in stishabite. So we uh, did some experiments, and we showed, if we'll look down here first, this is what they look, the specimens look like. You notice the stishabite experiments have these long um, prismatic crystals, whereas the cosite is nice little foam textures like quartz gives. Uh, and if we only have ferrous iron in the system, we can't get any uh, iron, there's no iron peak in um, cosite, but there's none in stishovite either. But if you, if you provide some ferric iron to the system, you can dissolve some ferric iron in the stishovite, but not in cosite. And as small as that peak is, it's enough to explain what we've got. And the aluminum peak is, is significantly bigger, but it, both of those two peaks are enough to explain the amount that we see in these needles. We submitted a paper like that, and we said it must have been stishovite, and it came right back. The, nobody was willing to believe that this rocket had stishovite in it. Um, so we went to work on the, those quartz domains themselves, and we measured the orientation of the needles. Well, nowadays there's this wonderful technique called EBSD, electron backscattered uh, diffraction, in which you can just put an electron beam down, and it'll tell you the orientation of all these crystals. But these crystals are too small. So we couldn't use EBSD, so we went back to the old-fashioned um, technique of a universal stage. How many people besides John Rosenfeld in this audience know what a universal stage is? Well, not too bad. Um, I spent a lot of time with the universal stage when I was at UCI, I'll tell you, <coughs> measuring quartz C axes. Uh, so we put them on, we, we took one of these domains, and we measured it all up, and we found that, in fact, it's far from being random. We found seven different um, uh, spots that were very highly um, populated, one of which was always populated much more than any of the others. And I, w reviewers weren't even satisfied by that, even though we showed we could show the full symmetry of, of stishovite that way. So we went back to another grain, actually, and found all those same spots and two more, and that was enough, and the paper was finally, was finally published. So what we actually found then was that the kyanite needles are displayed in such a way that when you put the mirror planes shown by the data that we have, you end up with uh, 4 over m, 2 over m, 2 over m symmetry, which is the symmetry of stishovite. So we didn't prove it was stishovite, but it's SiO2, and it's got the same symmetry as stishovite, so I don't think there's very many alternative choices. And here's a picture looking down the c-axis of a kyanite needle uh, in the structure uh, of stishovite, and as you can see, it fits very well. Um, just to show you the, the extreme depth compared to what we're used to thinking about in geology, here's two possible scenarios of exhumation curves of that material. It had to be far enough into the stishovite field that it could pre precipitate that stuff. So point number two and point number three are chosen so that they can precipitate the observed amounts of kyanite at this point. And then it comes on down here somewhere, and we know it's got to when it gets very close, we know it's got to go to the sylmanite field because there's sylmanite overprinting in this, in this rock. I haven't shown you, but the despacings that are inferred from the, uh, from the needle orientations are also consistent with them having been precipitated from stishamite. Then lastly, <coughs> I want to get to another rock which 
had stishovite in it. Um, and amazingly enough, you can put them on the same map. Um, this one comes from, um, from also from the Tibetan Plateau, uh, from about 5,000 meters. And it comes out of massive chromite. Uh, and this, these rocks have been being talked about by the Chinese since the first paper I know about was published in 86. Um, the first English language paper, I believe, was in the early 90s. But they've been telling one crazy story after another, mostly about finding diamonds and so on in the chromites. And many, many of the strange things, silicon carbide, native metals, you know it, you name it, they found it. And basically the community didn't believe it at all. Uh, and I have to say I've counted myself amongst, amongst them. And then one day, uh, Yang Jing Sui from, from Beijing came to Larissa and me with a specimen that had cosite in it. And we got very interested. Um, so here is a titanium iron metal pellet, which has been separated out of the heavies from this um, massive chromite. Um, and it's got all these wondrous little symplectic microstructures, which in fact have a high pressure story to tell too, but we haven't sorted that out yet. But down here, there's a little silicate rock, which you can't see yet. Uh, so here's this rock I'm talking about. It's 200 microns long approximately, maybe 50 microns across. But I call it a rock because it's polyphase material. You can see that there are elongated crystals and so on there. Uh, here, way out of, way, way burning out is the metal pellet. So let's make things easier to see. Here's the metal pellet again. Here's the stuff you were just looking at. Here, that box gives us this picture. And this, oops. And this picture gives us that box with some false color added. The blue is kyanite, the gray is kozite, and the red is an amorphous phase that we can't figure out what it is. The chemistry doesn't seem to tell us anything. There's no impact melt that might have that composition. There's no uh, known, uh, at least common, igneous rock that, uh, that might have that composition. We think it was probably some high pressure phase we haven't figured out yet that inverted to an amorphous phase at some point um, before now. Uh, so the rock's about 40% cosite or, or more. Um, and the amazing thing is it's unbelievably fresh. You can't find any evidence of quartz anywhere. Uh, and this picture is a picture of what stishovite looks like at, from an experiment. Uh, and so it, it was tempting to try to say, well, then these things must have been stishovite in the first place. So you can test that. We did EBSD now, because now we have some nice big crystals. We did EBSD along the, the length of two of these cosite crystals. And sure enough, they're polycrystalline. They aren't single crystals. Um, but if they had been cosite when they grew, that thing would be shaped in very strange shapes. Uh, it, it wouldn't be straight like you see on the left. Um, so this polycrystalline nature of the cosite proves that it's pseudomorphic after something. Uh, and again, it's silica, so it's almost surely um, stishovite. Uh, Subsequently, um, uh, Larissa and Richard Wirth um, and I did, well, Richard and uh, Larissa and Richard did the electron microscopy. We did transmission electron microscopy on this same stuff. And lo and behold, we found nitrides. Nitrides have never been found in mantle rocks before. Um, titanium nitride has been found once on Earth before in float in the Ural Mountains. Boron nitride of any kind has never been found in any natural rock or meteorite. Uh, we found the cubic form, the high pressure form. We found native iron. Um, and we found the high pressure form of TiO2, which has an alpha lead oxide form, uh, structure. <coughs> and this phase, w at the high temperature that would have to be beneath a ridge, let's say 1300 degrees centigrade perhaps at 300, degree, 300 kilometers, probably hotter than that, but if you take that temperature, um, then if you were lower than, um, than, than 1,300 degrees, you wouldn't get this phase, you would get rutile. So the fi finding this phase inside the cosite actually confirms that this must material must have originally been stishovite. So I want, I've got all these words because <clears throat> there's important stuff here. So these cosite crystals are polycrystalline uh, implying pseudomorphism, I just told you that. I just told you this part. What I didn't tell you about was we've done, uh, in collaboration with Ian Hutchins at, 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 at uh, Livermore, we've done nitrogen isotopes on these rocks. 
that they're about minus the delta fifth delta del 15n, delta 15n is about ten, minus 10. And there's nothing magic about that. There have been diamonds that have been found that have um, more negative than that. But uh, what it is, is it's inconsistent with subduction of anything from the surface, which always has positive values of delta 15 nitrogen. So if this is a subductive fragment of something, which you would think it was if it's mostly kyanite and, and silica, uh, the nitrogen had to get added somewhere else along the way. Um, moreover, we've shown that this, um, this, this ophiolite is not unique. Um, the original finder of this material, as I said, Yang Jing Sui, um, went to the polar Urals where he figured out, he, he decided that the, the most likely ophiolite to be like this one was there. He went there, he collected massive chromite, he brought it back, he ground it up in the same machine, separated out the heavies and came back with a fistful of diamonds and some, some um, silicon carbide. So there's some subset of ophiolites that have this very high pressure signal in them. Uh, so uh, this rock fragment clearly comes from great depth. So that implies that at least some of the chromite at Lubasaw has come up in the solid state, uh, all of the massive chromite probably, um, preserving very reducing conditions inside, uh, despite the oxidizing magmatic environment. Um, near the surface, and that probably explains why neither the cosite nor the TiO2-2 have any reaction to the low pressure phase at all. Uh, but geologically, again, if chromite came up in the solid state, then it must have been, then the surrounding Hartsbergite also must have come up solid because chromite's extremely dense, and if the rock, rest of the rock were, were partially molten uh, of any significant amount, uh, degree, they wouldn't be able to, to carry um, the chromite. Uh, and in fact, uh, recently now, diamonds have been found in the Hartsbergite um, surrounding this um, chromite. So, I come to the end. Uh, looking smaller to see larger and comparing experimental and natural observations, uh, by doing such, uh, we've provided a simple explanation for why earthquakes exhibit a bimodal abundance with depth and why they stop at the base of the mantle. And we determined that rocks come to the surface from much greater depths than had previously been recognized. Uh, and we've discovered this very high pressure minerals uh, in an ophiolite, uh, in, including nitrides, uh, which is a big surprise. It opens a new window into mantle convection. I shouldn't have an S there, sorry. And these discoveries, all originally controversial, have opened new windows into studies of the processes acting during upwelling at ridges and during deep subduction and during continental collision. Um, so I come um, to the end. Uh, there's a long list of collaborators here, which I won't go through all of them. Uh, the green ones over here are, are machinists from my laboratory. Um, and I want to give special thanks to my mentors at UCLA who started me on this quest. John is in the audience, uh, and it was from John I got my curiosity about um, thermodynamics and, and, and symmetry. Uh, and in particular, I want to thank my wife, Manuela, who's also here in the audience who's a scientist in her own right and who's been an inspiration and support to me over all of these years. And that's a picture undoctored, there's no Photoshop there, taken at sunset, I think it was two o'clock in the morning, in one of these high pressure terrains uh, in Norway on, on the summer solstice eve, and there you see the bonfire dying down. Now that's the end, but if I may, may I take two more minutes, three more minutes, I want to show a bunch of pictures of continents moving around. Okay, someone said yes. So I showed a few of these panels before. Uh, let's go back 730 million years. Um, and I must say, these are not mine, these, these pictures. Um, and I'm ashamed to say I've lost the uh, attribution. Um, so please excuse me for that, but I found them on the web and now I've lost their, their, um, where they came from. Anyway, that's 730 million years. The, the current view is that the pieces of, of, of our planet, which were above sea lo level, if we take them all apart, they would, look, they would have that distribution, which doesn't look like anything we know anything about. And at 690, it was a little different, but didn't help much. 650, not much better than that. 610, still a mess. Still doesn't look like much, but ooh, what's this? There's North America. Um, 
Um, let's see what we can find here. Um, you begin to see some, there's a whole lot of stuff down here at 410, you see, Gondwana. Um, and now things are starting to come back, to go looking a little bit more um, reasonable. Now we're at 330 million years. I'm having trouble seeing myself. Okay, now I can see. So here we got, we have Africa, and, um, and here's North America snuggled up against Africa. There's South America over here. We're at 250 million years. Uh, here's India is still way down at the South Pole. There's Australia, but they're beginning to take shape. You can see their shapes now. Um, here's um, 210, uh, 170, 130. Now the, the North Atlantic is open. Uh, 90, the South Atlantic is open. Here's India getting ready for its charge across the way, and there it goes. Uh, boom, it runs into Asia, and there we are. Thank you very much. First, uh, for all your efforts, we have this wonderful certificate. Uh, okay, thank you. This is uh, the Distinguished uh, Alumni Lecturer uh, certificate. I'll, I'll put this right uh, next to my I've Nobel Prize. Like <laughs> I'll put this right next to my Nobel it's Prize. It's frameable. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, more importantly, there is this uh, UCLA kind of uh, memento here. So this is for you as well. Okay. And uh, am I never go anywhere. Am I supposed it. to open that, or, open or, or is this I'll just what it is? Like it. <laughs> There's more than paper here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, it's heavy. It, it is. A book of some sort. With three degrees from UCLA, you can't forget anyway, but we're absolutely going to be sure that you don't forget that you're so this is from here. <laughs> create visions of UCLA in what? Anyway, anyway you, it's you can, a, you can uh, look over that. If you it, Questions uh, for it, Harry? It's a book. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm not quite free sure at what time you were talking about, in, in but I'm talking about free water, yes. Uh, serpentine is a, phase. for example, serpentine is a mineral which contains water as part of its structure. But as you raise the temperature, you get to a certain point and it breaks down and forms other minerals that don't have any water in the structure and it releases a lot of water. As a free separate phase, yeah. As a separate phase, yes. Well, first of all, I have to tell you why I've not been there. But there's only actually only one, the, the, the Lobusa one I was, that I showed data from. Um, and the other one is the, from the polar Urals where the original discoverer went to see if he could find something similar from the chromites there. Um, I was supposed to go a few years ago to, the, uh, to see these, this ophiolite, and the Tibetan uh, problem, shall we say, erupted and the Chinese government wouldn't let me go. Uh, so I've not, been, I've not seen these rocks in the, in the field, but I, I know many people who have. There are gabbros that are not metamorphosed. Uh, and what, how well structured the uh, ophiolite, I have a, a slide that doesn't really answer your question, but it, is, it, really, it, it, it really does seem to be an ophiolite, uh, not just some basaltic rocks and whatever. I and mean, there's a lot of, of Hartsburgite um, there are various dunite pods, like there are commonly in, um, in ophiolites. Um, and then there's, uh, whether there are, Larissa, do you know whether there are any sheeted dikes in Lobosa? Yes, there are. There are. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's been tectonized, but it's, it hasn't been subducted, and it surely hasn't been hit by a, an impactite. 
Um, what, that was one of the reasons we wanted to see if it was unique, because if you find another one, it wouldn't be likely to have been hit by a meteorite also. Uh, <clears throat> but most importantly, it tells us that this is not just some weird fluke, that this is a story about the mantle rocks and ophiolites that has not been known before. And it probably isn't there in all ophiolites. One thing I did not mention, there's a Japanese group that's actually found cosite exolving from chromite. And they think it probably didn't, it wasn't dissolved in chromite, but it actually exolved from a high pressure polymorph of chromite. Uh, yeah, this, if I may, two quick ones. When you say a rock that's gone down between or fifty kilometers and rapidly come back to the surface, how does rapidly translate into geologic time? And also, I don't quite understand, because this isn't my field, mm -hmm. the things that you do. Um, what's the relation or implication of chromite? To, uh, to death. Does that mean it's gone into particularly deep rock? Okay, so the second one, that's my fault. I should have explained that better. Um, in ophiolites, these things which we believe are fossil ocean spreading centers, um, there's almost always, maybe always, uh, found the deposits uh, of chromite. And it's the cro those chromites are the only exploitable ore of chromium in the world, so we probably know where all of them are because <laughs> people want to, want to uh, exploit them. Uh, and there are, texturally, there are three kinds of chromite. There's massive chromite, which is just looks like a rock, but the rock is made of chromite. Um, and there are nodular ore of chromite where there's, it looks like jelly beans of the, of the chromite. And then there's dispersed with just, you find cr crystals here and there. And in this ophiolite, those other kinds are perfectly normal. They fit all the stories that people have put together as to how you would explain chromite. Um, and indeed, many of the chrome crystals, chromite crystals, have low, low pressure phases included in them during growth. Um, but there's this funny story that is inside the massive chromites. And it's, first of all, a very, very low oxygen fugacitive story. Uh, with native metals and silicon carbide and things like that. Um, and so the only way that can be there is if that rock has been essentially tight enough that despite how long the rocks may have sat near the surface, hot or cold, that the oxidizing atmosphere uh, ambient in the, in the upper mantle couldn't get through, didn't get there. Um, now, why the reaction of these high pressure phases, why they didn't react at all back toward, well not back, but to the low pressure ones, uh, is a real puzzle in these other ultra high pressure rocks, which where you find cosite and diamond and so on. You find the cosite reacting to quartz, you find the diamond reacting to graphite. Um, in the one instance that's been found of the TiO2 high pressure form, you find it reacting to uh, to rutile, um, and here there's no reaction whatsoever. Uh, so it's got to be that the very low oxygen fugacity, which therefore means a very low water fugacity, is responsible. The catalytic effect of water, which is just so dominant in so many things, is just n not there because there's no activity for water. That's the only answer we can, we can offer for that. And the first question was, what's rapid oh, what's rapid? I also, I, also, I must have misled you. When I talked about the rocks had to go down fast and come back fast, I was only talking about the, rock, the work that Gary Ernst did, uh, <clears throat> where he w was trying to use his experiments, which were then quite low pressure experiments, to explain the blue amphibole in the, in the Franciscan. And so then they, they had to go down and fast, geologically speaking, rapid. Um, they had to go down and come back in, I don't know, 10 million years? Uh, pardon? Five. Five million years, okay. Um, but these other very much deeper rocks, there are a number of cases where people have been able to estimate how fast they're coming up. Um, and they're coming up in um, meters per, well, more than meter, meters per, per million years, surely. But, so geologically, they're really coming quite fast. Uh, they go down, the, of course, subduction goes down at um, tens of centimeters per year. And these things are coming back at that speed or more. 
Um, and, pardon? Super tectonic Yeah. And again, I think the answer to that is because the stuff got dragged down at, at, at tectonic rates. But once, if you've got very low uh, density material and it gets warmed up so it's not being held in a vice grip by the heavier stuff anymore, um, it's going to start going up. And as it starts going up, it's going to... Um, it, 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 if it ever finds any water, then it's going to melt a lot and so on. So the, uh, it's not exactly clear where the, there's lots of, there's usually a lot of melt associated with the surrounding white rocks in these, in these terrains. Uh, and usually you can find no evidence in the surrounding rock at all. You find these eclogites and pertotites uh, with high pressure minerals in them or high pressure memory of some sort. And the surrounding rock just shows nothing. But the Chinese solved that problem. They put an army of people to work uh, take, separating zircons out of the white rocks. And the zircons all have cosite in them. So there is a memory there. It's just very hard to find. And you only find it in the zircons because it's the only thing which has been refractory enough to withstand partial melting and all the reactions that take place in those uh, continental rocks. Whereas the more refractory ones, the eclogites and the, and the peridotites, um, they don't react as easily, and so they still carry a little bit more of the information. Yes, sir. Well, oh. Last question. Uh, about, the, about the cracks and the anti-cracks, the tension and compression, and uh, is, it, is it really possible to tell anything about why? Like I understood, like in construction, that rock doesn't really have potential strength, but, uh, but in situ like this, is there any way you can tell about no, it's very weak. Ro rocks are, are very weak in tension. Um, the, they're, they're, they're brittle materials. And so if you put them you know, at, at shallow depth and you pull on them or anything, they will, they'll break immediately. And in fact, pushing on them, those, all those little cracks, they're, it's actually tensile failure. The, all those little uh, white lines that I drew in that little cartoon in the beginning representing little cracks, those are cracks which open because there's a stress concentration somewhere at grain boundaries that don't exactly fit or some alteration in a granite or whatever it might be. There'll be some sort of a stress concentration and as you're loading up the material at some point you get to the tensile failure stress of that little local region and it cracks. And the crack then runs away from that stress concentration the crack usually curls around until it's parallel to the compression direction and when it gets far enough away that the stress is, at the tip is no longer above the, the, the failure stress, it stops. And so you get all those little bitty um, cracks. It's a little bit different with the anti-cracks, but the critical thing is that the, the shape of the anti-cracks tells us that the material inside has essentially no strength. Um, there's no shear tractions on the inside of those things. And then the, co the co compressive stresses at the end are simply caused by the volume change. Uh, what I didn't talk about was we did one ex kind of experiment in a, in, in a different material, in cadmium titanate, in which we, the material that formed these lenses of, with fine grain material in them was of, greater, of lesser density than the starting material. And that produced the same lenses with stress concentrations but they were actually lenses parallel to compression with tensile, with, with tensile stress concentrations. So this self-organization business being the same between the anti-cracks and the cracks is pretty much proven. Thank you, Harry. Let's thank uh, Harry once again. For thank you very much.